anytime soon. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this first session of panels in the um, symposium. My name is Michelle Ovarenga. I am the chair of the session and I'm going to start presenting the participants. The first one to speak today is Alessandra Cristina Rigonato. She is a lecturer at the Federal University of Tocantins, UFT, in Brazil, where she works on English language studies. She completed her PhD at the University of Sao Paulo on Northern Irish contemporary theatre and its connections with the conflict of the Troubles. She is a director of the Brazilian Association of Irish Studies. Alessandra, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you can start your presentation. Thank you, Michele. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm very glad to see any people to not to see because we are uh, uh, now the screens, the, our screen are people also. So we are seeing each other uh, through this, this different media. And um, well, I would like to, to share my, my presentation firstly um and check with you if you can if you are able to to see if it's presenting can you can you all see yes it? it's mm -hmm. working alessandra yeah okay thank you and can you hear me well because sometimes my computer sound sounds weird um okay so let me start so uh just to check Michelle, we have uh, 15 minutes, right? Yes, 15. 15. Uh, I'm going to time myself. Because yes, that's the hard part, but yes. 15 <laughs> minutes. Okay, that, okay, so let's start. I'm starting uh, counting down now. So uh, my presentation today, it's part, it's a very small part of uh, my PhD thesis. I, I tried to analyze the humor, the humor mode, uh, or the comic mode, in the in, in, in the contemporary contemporary from from the from the eighties. My my uh, first play is from the eighties until uh, two thousand sixteen. So I tried to to see how humor. In my thesis, I try to see how humor, humor, uh, the evolution of humor through the years. So I could, I could get some to some conclusions, such as uh, when we are closer to the conflict, we have a more um, dark humor uh, instances in the plays, right? And as soon as we get closer to 2016, we have. Uh, we have almost, we cannot even say that, but there is almost uh, something that would look like a comedy. That, uh, so, uh, but this was my, my thesis. And so I just got a very small part of it for to fit in the time we have. So Laughing Matters, Humor and Cultural Trauma in A Night in November uh, by Mary Jones. So it's a play from 1994. Uh, it's, it's a very important year because we have the ceasefire of the, 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 the IRA ceasefire uh, in, in, in this time, right? So it was a, a connection with the context. So in my talk, I would like to, to attempt to, to draw some thoughts on three points. The first one a brief context of Northern Ireland, the troubles in Northern Ireland. The second one uh, present Mary Jones, the, the artist um, uh, with which play we are working with. And thirdly, uh, how, uh, what specific kind of humor I have found in Anai in November. So uh, the three questions that guide my, my presentation are, could violent episodes of history be portrayed through humor? Something very, uh, very painful, such as the troubles. How, how is that possible? My question was, uh, what, if so, what kind of humor would it be? 
And thirdly, is the comic mode an attempt to relieve sorrows or try to understand sorrows? What's, what would be the function of uh, the comic mode in this, in, this, in this point? So setting the context, uh, the, it's a brief uh, introduction, mostly for those who are not familiar with the, the troubles. So uh, the partition of Ireland was in, in 1929, where we established, they, they were established the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland as a separate country still uh, that still remains part of Europe, uh, European Union, no, not anymore, uh, UK, right? It's a uh, UK Union. So, um, and some parts that are important in this partition, what happened after this partition, right? How, how was it, um, how was it thought, right? So we have the unionist um, parties and the, the Catholic parties, right? And in the, so I, I quote Mark Mulholland, um, Eunice has clarified the electoral systems. So what kind of inequality we um, happened after to, uh, 1922 to in which the, the Catholic is a minority, the Catholic community is uh, the minority part and the, the inequality with the, the, the Protestant uh, community in elections, for example. So Eunice clarified the electoral system by abolishing proportional representation in 1929. This weakened minority parties, particularly labor, and consolidated the unionist, unionist and nationalist rift. So we have um, less power for the nationalist party. And also another uh, measure that provided inequality in the area, the gerry uh, gerrymandering. So I quote uh, Moholland again, uh, Protestants made up the majority of the 250,000, thus deprived of local government vote but Catholics being lower down the socioeconomic scale and thus less likely to pay rates were disproportionately outside the franchise. So they had less places in the House of Common. The troubles in Northern Ireland uh, broke up in the late uh, 60s with the civil rights movement, right? And then here um, we have an episode I just I just put here, um, bloody, the Bloody Sunday of Derry in 1972, because these uh, civil rights movements were oppressed by the RUC and the British Army. And uh, in 72, for example, more than 14 people were killed in, during the protest, right? And on the other hand, we have some uh, paramilitary groups that were raised in this conflict, such as IRA from the Catholic side and UVF and UFF from the Protestant side. And we arrived to a pre, uh, in the end of the peace process in the Good Friday Agreement, 1998. It's really brief because uh, just to set the, the context of the play, right? And now we are, uh, we are introduced to Mary Jones. She was born in Belfast in 1951, worked as an actress, and in 83, uh, she founded, uh, with uh, other four actresses, the Charabank, the, the company in which they would uh, set place where women could work. Right? In 1991, she founded a double, double joint theater alongside Pam Brighton and Mark Lambert. And in this company, she, um, she premiered the, the play A Night in November. Right? I, here there is a, a cover. Um, I, I try to find different covers of the play. It's not the cover I have. I have one with the cow. <laughs> that it's uh, the um, 
because there is the stones in his pockets and a night in November, both plays are in the same book, but the picture is the rural Ireland. So, but not the case of a night in November because it, it set in Belfast also. A night in, a night in October, I, I took the liberty to change the month here to talk about the, the episode of the Troubles that is the place directly connected to. So uh, this is a, also an episode from history, right? So uh, the, the, the killing of many Catholics during the Halloween, right, was the 31st of October then 1993. There was an attempt to, uh, so before, Okay, before the, the attack to the Catholics, there was an attempt to wipe out the leadership of the UFF, meeting in an office over a chip shop on the Shank Hill Road in Belfast. Uh, it failed when the bomb went off prematurely. One bomber and nine civilians died. Our trade was universal. Loyalist, loyalist paramil paramilitaries killed a total of 12 Catholic civilians over the following week. So this is the event that um, a night in November portrays, right? So the next week, later then, uh, later that month, that month, loyalists shot and killed five, four Catholics and one Protestants at Gray Steel Bar, County Derry. Uh, so uh, as a concept, that I used in the in my thesis also uh, was uh, the cultural trauma. So how this history, this this shared trauma. So I just uh, added here the concept by Jeffrey Alexander. Uh, cultural trauma occurs occurs when members of a collectivity feel they have been subjected to a horrendous event. So that what as we see uh, Kenneth, the, the protagonist of A Night in November. He goes with his father-in-law to a football match, and then he experiences being part, not of the victims, but being part of the, the community who uh, was the, the, the perpetrator in the time, right? So I just quote a short uh, part of the of the, the beginning of this football match. So they are watching a game between Northern Ireland and Ireland to, um, to, to, the, the, to enter in the World Cup, to see who, who is the, which country would enter in the, in the World Cup. And then uh, his father-in-law says, hear that, Kenny, hear that, our boys miss nothing. He laughs, then shouts, Gray still seven. Ireland knew. So the score they were screaming in the match was this score here we saw in this uh, event. Uh, Grace to seven, Ireland knew. Do da, do da day. Hey, I started the one and now thousands has joined in. So the father-in-law started the, the, the saying during the, the game and the community joined this uh, making fun in a very horrible way of the, the killing in Greystill. It was me that started it. Me, Ernie Thompson, Magic, Greystill 7, Ireland New, Greystill 7, Ireland New. And then we have the position of Kenny, who is ashamed of staying the same place as men like him. It's beyond words and it's beyond feeling. I'm numb. Grace till seven, Ireland new. Trick or treat. Men walk into a pub on Halloween, shout trick or treat and mow down seven innocent people. And these fucking barbarians are laughing. Surely to God, surely to Christ. These are not people I'm part of. No, it's not. Don't tell me. I'm not hearing them. I'm not. I can't fucking handle it. Then I started. So I uh, this the the bold part I did it. This is not in the play, but uh, because of the, the reaction of the other characters, right? 
the barbarians are laughing. So what kind of laugh is that? Uh, Bakhtin talks about uh, the kind of humor in Carnival, where we have death and life symbolizing um, a balance in the society. So in the Carnival, we have an inversion, right? The, uh, so a fool is made a king, right? He studies this movement from Middle Ages. And um, and there is this, this so the, the inversion becomes grotesque, right? And also the, the body in, in its monstrous, right? So I'm just going to take a quick look here. Um, the king, right, is uncrowned. It transformed into a funny monster. So uh, what we see here with Ernie seems to be this, this grotesque monster through Kenny's eyes. And then Kristeva talks about the other type of humor in Celine's laughter, right? In the, in the, in the book, The Powers of Horror. She says um, this kind of laughter of the, the madman immersed on his own complicity in the grotesque and real destructiveness of modern warfare, it disrupts with the idea of regenerative comedy because the horror of comedy would would reestablish would reestablish um, balance into the society, right? So um, my my last question in the in the play, a night in November, is if it's it an attempt to a regenerative comedy because Kenny, the main character, he gets horrified, he, he, he sees horror when we see, he sees the humor that Ernie portrays, right? So, uh, and then he moved to, with uh, Ireland. My time is off, but I have just one more minute. Sure. So just, he goes with this other community, with the, the Catholics community, because Ireland uh, wins the game and they go to United States to the World Cup. And then he gets part, he goes also, and he, he becomes part of the Catholic community. He ends with, I'm a free, uh, free from, from, from the, the bigotry of this the, the, in Northern Ireland. I'm free of it. I'm a free man. I'm a Protestant man, and I am an Irishman. So uh, to me, it seems like an, uh, an attempt to, to construct uh, a regenerative comedy. And lastly, the final thoughts on the questions that I, I showed. Uh, I, I, I came to the conclusion that violent episodes of history are portrayed through a particular kind of humor in the night in November. The grotesque, grotesque form of humor in the figure of Ernie horrifies the main character, Kenny. Kenny decides, therefore, to be apart from his, from his community. The comedy created by Mary Jones is not an attempt to relieve sorrows, but humor is used in the play as a magnifying glass that amplifies the horror of the violence. And here we have some words cited, and I thank you very much for attending just on time <laughs> thank you so much thank Alessandra. You. great presentation thank you so much thank Loved you it. i'm sorry i have some have some things i want to ask you i have already put some things there thank okay. you so much now i'm going to present uh what is should i say irene portela or irene how do you prefer irene portela then has a master in social anthropology um, that was taken the, in the, the National Museum of, of Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, and a doctorate degree in political science by um, the, uni the Federal University of Universidade Federal Fluminense. Uh, the doctoral dissertation is entitled On the Excuse of Ireland, Unwords, Wars, Subjects, Little Voices, democracies. Irene was for many years a researcher and a university teacher. 
She also worked in the coordination of science education of MAST, Museo de Astronomia e Ciências, Afins. She is currently an associate researcher of uh, Centro de Estudos Interdisciplinares da Universidade de Coimbra, and she is living in the southwest of Ireland. I'm going to copy and paste her email in the chat in case you want to contact Irene directly, okay? So welcome, Irene. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, you can start your presentation. Sure. Let me try and go for the... Okay, hold on a second. The sharing. Um... Okay, uh, here we go. <laughs> And uh, so I'm going to, I have prepared myself for 20 minutes and I tend to be a bit prolix. So I'll try and shorten it down as much as I can. Please tell me if I'm going to, to pass my time too much. Uh, the, the title of the presentation is The Result of Many Wars, Irish Democracy in the Follow-up to the Period of Independence. It draws to some extent uh, on, on, my, on my doctoral dissertation, but it also has to do with issues that I've been trying to put a project together, that I'm currently putting a project together. And I very much hope that we can discuss it, uh, about it later and if you can help me about it. The main point is that democracy was an obvious characteristic of Ireland since independence. From a procedural point of view, it's all, it was always there. And I yeah, totally agree. Obviously, there's not, no way not to agree with it. That, but there's democracy indeed, but there were many wars behind it. And to some extent, there's wars that still, micro wars that are still ongoing. And how can we address it? I think the main contribution that the uh, Irish period, the period around independence and its outcome can uh, somehow represent is exactly the, the idea of a non-Socratic perspective, non-Socratic perspective about democracy, about social life and about what it is to, to move in a, a more inclusive and broader perspective of democracy. I deal very much with uh, Rancière, Lefort, and so forth. Uh, my current uh, personal academic issues, and that's exactly what I'm, I'm kind of coming from, say, it's the limits of its application. How to bring together the, 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 the success, the democratic political success, uh, achievements in Ireland with the shadows that were and are still so lasting. I can think about many other things, but the obvious ones, women and children, travelers, uh, mental disease, direct provision, uh, refusal of our citizenship to children born in Ireland, uh, homelessness, and so forth. Uh, I, I, I'm going to, to skip a bit, but... Uh, uh, Irene, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt you. Should we be seeing your screen being shared by now? Aren't you seeing it? I'm not. No, we're not. So oh, let's, good Lord. Let's just try. So just go again to that square with the arrow inside. Yes, I'm so sorry. Uh, don't worry. Don't worry. It was a very good introduction. We just want to make sure you. <laughs> I'm just I want to make sure you have everything you need for your presentation. Okay. I will give you the the okay if we're seeing it or not. You uh, should not be seeing us. So if you're seeing us, it's a problem. I wasn't seeing you. So, oh, okay. I'll have to go back again. It said an error. Okay. Part. Sorry, give me just one. No, okay, don't worry, don't worry. The, the, these things so, happen. Okay, hold on. Owen, can you give me a help? Look. Are you putting are you putting share screen, the, the entire screen? Yes. And then uh, if it says Meet Google is sharing your screen. But it's not appearing to us. That's a strange. So strange. Uh, now, uh, what should I do? Is it not working? It doesn't seem to be working. Just cancel everything and do again. Yeah, that's that's always a good solution, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry. Stop sharing. Now cancel. Sorry about that, really. Don't worry, please. Please don't worry about it. Uh, oh, so I just go here and put for. Am I doing something wrong? You're on high screen. Yeah, but I have to open it first, right? Okay. Okay. And then, uh, but I, then I can't go back here. Okay. Just go through it this way. Yeah, I'll okay. go through this way. Yeah. Oh. 
Oh, sorry, Owen. I think I will do it with. I'm not managing yet. No, yeah, just just take your time. We we can manage. Don't worry. No, please come here and help me do it. Sorry. Uh, Don't so worry. I just cancel again. So what do I have here? I have. But I've known that put it in, in I will put it there yeah. straight so I can't go that yeah. way. So I'm trying again this way. And I go for the uh, screen. Yeah. Yeah. And share. Then I try share and it's not letting me open. Then go to share window. Cancel. Okay, cancel and I try the share window. Yeah. Okay. Maybe now it will Yeah. Work. Okay, share. Okay. Can you see me now? Yes, we can. Sorry about that. that. Don't worry, please don't worry. This, these things happen, okay? Please don't worry. We are in time. Take your time. Everything's okay. I just wanted to make sure you had everything you needed because I saw that you were, you know, as if we were. We had to see what you're seeing. So I just wanted to double check. You can. Okay, you can great. Move on. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, it, it had to be to share window, but uh, so I, I will try to, to shorten it a bit. And the one of the points uh, I, 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 I argue and I, I can defend, I think it's quite arguably, uh, uh, it's that uh, exactly that period in 1916 rising, the war of independence, civil war and the Xing period are key to understanding the success of Irish democracy. Uh, from an obvious perspective, yes, but from there's a way to read them that would make them make sense and i think particularly it's this idea that the treaty debates and the civil war highlighted very clearly it was a kind of division where the others were mingled with the selves so and also the public and the private were clearly very broadly interwoven so th that meant that the single solution for this kind of multiplicity could not be put forward it would in a way mean a whole destruction say the the after that period of huge turmoil you have a sort of normalcy instated in the political arena uh, which had several components of democracy and i will go into a bit more of detail about that clearly but also had the ongoing micro wars that i'm that i'm kind of uh, referring uh, staying and kind of gaining adeptness that it's kept going till nowadays say uh, now yeah so uh and uh, again uh just to it's it's issues that were present then uh, that are still present nowadays and that i it seems to me uh should be addressed in the same somehow process and maybe help to be overcome with the same kind with tools that might be analogous to, to the ones uh, suggested here. It's this whole idea of towns, cities, families being torn, being divided. It, it's everywhere in the literature. And just that, that the branch one is one that just came across. It was written two years ago. The Catholic coat that was everywhere. And again, that has something that was related to, to politics, the direct politics to some extent. But you have the Magdalene boundaries, the Tume report that came out just now, the whole idea of the culture of secrecy and the Kerry babies, I'm living in Kerry. Uh, so uh, it's, it's what it's kept hidden. It's uh, the abuses of women, of children, the psychiatric hospitals, the travelers, the significant absence of the travelers and the, the sort of, uh, they made, made into things, and the, the children born in Ireland, and again, the idea of direct provision, asylum seekers, and you can't you can keep going, homelessness and so forth. Uh, the, the, again, this, the, I, it, it is, it seems almost anatomic to say that there was not a winning side, but because obviously there was a winning side to the civil war, but it's the, the idea that it could not be won in an obvious way. And uh, forms of talkativeness, I think it's, it's, it's talkativeness, I know it's a bit too much of a stereotype, but it's, I think it's something quite useful as well to bring forward to, to, to think about what was at stake. Uh, and and the, what was at stake that went beyond the obvious, the obvious forms that it presented itself. Uh, the, I think the, the 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 rising became a sort of personal matter, 
through the killing of the leaders. But several several authors have made that point, but that clearly was when people uh, and the Tishikaha series uh, in 2016 were brilliant that way. Uh, it made that 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 that's very clear. They become people. They don't become just an idea. They don't become something to come forward. They don't become just part of one single narrative, but they, they become somebody there. Um, I uh, believe also that the Black and Trans and the War of Independence had that kind of unifying effect in the sense of creating a clear uh, other and us to some extent, but to there is an enmity there to be fought. And when I talk about the treaty negotiations, I don't mean how bad statesmen as, oh, they were statesmen, but I, I think to some extent what was brought and, 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 and kind of appeared afterwards is this idea exactly that people that went to negotiate there did the negotiations by themselves and somehow stopped being so mingled, so personally present and so personally, therefore, controllable. I will come back to that, uh, to this idea of uh, you have to be just one of us to some extent. The treaty debates, and uh, in in this, I think it's uh, it's uh, worth coming to uh, just go back to the, the other slide as well. Uh, they were is exactly political and personal all the time. That's this, this going to happen, this reenactment now in December 2021 and January 2022. And this was this article of Ronan McGreevy, where I think it, it puts very clearly the insults were exchanged and the vitriol was personal, not political, among all comrades who now found themselves in a death grapple about the future of the infant state. And it's worth pinpointing as well that at least five of the six women, the only six women that were in the treaty negotiated in the treaty debates, had personal huge losses, pains. So I think the whole idea of pain, uh, personal pain, pain, and what it's at stake, it's very much again at the source of uh, what happened and what happened, what happened straightly afterwards and what endured. Uh, no, I was just going to go back. So uh, I, I, I will, as again, I will go back to this idea of the, uh, I think, which I think is, is core, the PRS TV, and it was brilliant that Alessandra brought it. Uh, um, and uh, uh, and and to the to the aftermath of the of the of the of the, of the, of the, the free state itself, but uh, I would like to 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 point as well to this idea that. Uh, what happened straight afterwards, Kumanagadale government, uh, was the idea of state and safety. So somehow you, you put the state in, to some extent, a way. There's a violence. There's an obvious violence in that, and everybody knows what, what, uh, what was there. Uh, and, and so it's played like that. There is, and, and I never deny that, that's uh, the, the importance of high politics and of the political leaders. It's uh, even in the, in the peaceful transition of power. But again, what you have afterwards is the Catholic mantle and, okay, the Irish language to some extent, but much less, uh, installing itself as something that kind of puts everything and 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 the idea of the Valera that he can mingle those things, uh, being uh, I have the famous phrase: "I only have to look at my heart to know what the Irish people think," and so forth. And and his role as keeping things together. I think Fanning's Fanning's uh, Fanning makes the point of the the about the thirty seven Constitution that uh, the the Catholic the Catholicism and the Irish language were had a, a very important function as a device for bonding together deeply divided people. That is a point, but I think it goes well beyond that. Again, I just want to stress here that throughout. And, 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 and perhaps unknowingly in the sense that the political institutions and even the, 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 the PR STV itself, uh, the referenda uh, to some extent, and uh, um, they were part of what was inherited uh, in terms of institutions, but it was the way it came to be practiced and to be, came to be known and, and kind of possessed 
especially I'm particularly interested in the TV and then the clinics and canvassing that characterize so much Irish politics um, as, as something that became fairly characteristic of, of Irish democracy and attempts to, to remove it uh, were, were lost, uh, attempted by, by Fianna Fáil anyway. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to, to very quickly uh, bring in this whole idea that the, the that most and it's just to put it is in, in the say the literature cultural scenario which is normally associated with the national scenario and then in the stereographic uh, scenario the idea that you cannot have that you have wars uh at times more, you have more peaceful uh, uh proponents say uh frank o'connor clearly a much more peaceful proponent and the fact that he writes the big fellow collins being on the other side or Guess of the nation, uh, the famous guess of the nation. Even his autobiography, it's this idea where I'm, where I connect, uh, and where I go. And you have the more militant, say, once like Moran is the obvious case, uh, Corkery, much more gentle. But it's this idea of something having to be brought forward. Sean of uh, and the 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 Vive Moi, uh, his autobiography is, is is clearly an example of that as well. But it's again it's the idea that you have many forms of talk you have attempts of building narratives but more than than winning narratives you have talks you have narratives now the same happened uh, and it, 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 it probably many of you heard about that the 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 debate between uh, nationalists revisionists and anti-revisionists non-nationalists and so forth and which was uh, uh, to to a great extent uh, uh, um, triggered by the the attempt of uh, Francis Shaw to publish the canon the attempt no, the refusal of, of uh, publication by studies in 1966 to commemorate the 50th anniversary anniversary of the rising of the calendar of Irish history. Uh, but the, the, I think the point that I, I think it's worth to, to, to do, which was, it's, it's funny in a way, looking at, uh, it's funny to some extent, it's that there were some efforts of control on homogenization, especially on the revisionist side. It's a, a sort of prep supposition that the political and the daily scenes should be divested of social energy and density, and that history and the historians and academic thought in general uh, would have the power of informing of deciding of saying what it is to be uh, and just uh, obviously that doesn't happen there's this uh, joke parody again the the alessandra bringing the the idea of humor it's it's fantastic because it's all, all overall uh, when it comes to discussions about irish history um that history is something present there's many histories and just I just been picked up one one case the, the one of Seamus McManus book the, it's a huge book the story of the Irish race it's a very good example of mission form sources kinds of arguments it brings everything together from sanishis to work to to historical sources to and it's still a grand narrative and there's many grand narratives so again there's no winning there's somehow no winning sides in there now sorry uh so what I, one of the things that i suggest just from to, to sum up that is was this idea that socratic attempts in ireland uh, uh were at the source of implicit but maybe also of the more hidden and still ongoing wars uh its failure and the success of irish democracy can to a large extent be attributed to the room given to the little voices the always changing people of have always changing people uh what matters is that it helps to make the face of the nation to have correspondence with it, its people creates control of the structures and political figures of power prevents the corruption into authoritarianism i'm moving and i pr promise i won't be much longer uh there's also this idea uh, uh, probably and um, the idea of pain and again alessandra bringing pain <laughs> forward was fantastic uh there was the domination by Albion was linked to deep pains, and all the deep pains were present in the separation from Great uh, Britain and in the split in the market free states first. Uh, the troubles probably don't have some connection to it. Uh, there was room for authoritarian pragmatism, uh, and but and especially to daily processes of micro violence. Uh, 
the democratic procedures were maintained throughout, throughout but more relevant even in this uh, in this uh, more 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 obvious scenario is it was the presence of consideration mechanisms and again i highlight vprs tv the offering of clinics that is you offer services yes it is often said oh but it's personal oh it's uh, uh populist oh it's uh, it's local. Yes, it is local. <laughs> it is personal. It is local. It is national. And if some extent of the EU is not seen as so far away, it's because to some extent comes from clinics and comes from a personal canvassing. So you have services, but you also have a sort of auscultation. And that kind of intercourse between electors and their potential representatives means the political agendas will contain at least to some degree the inputs they brought in. The referenda, again, are key in this. So the, the question is, what fears are still so strong that prevent a broader democracy, promote the creation of foreign groups, and I'm talking about foreign groups as women being foreign, children being foreign, uh, asylum seekers being foreign, travelers being foreign, or I just use the expression, as I could maybe choose another one, upon which such pains and suffering is still inflicted. A work exploitation relations should maybe be seen into there as well. Uh, again, uh, the hubbub, the buzz, the talkativeness is a fundamental trait of Irish democracy, co coherent with a fervent sense of social life. Uh, how to overcome its current limits? The little voices, uh, the maintenance at least of a vanishing point of the vagueness of subjects and entities, apart with the listening of the little voices, was extremely significant to the persistence of Irish democracy. Is this point useful to deal with the ongoing wars, microviolence, or do we have to bring back old categories? I still think that to understand how authoritarian violence and its related microviolence did not gain full cause in Ireland is key to look at the social and political forms of social interaction in place, that the relinquish and interpretation of people and the worlds they build throughout their life is one dimensional. Would an answer to that again, here I go, to the microvision of violence and pains inflicted reside in the sort of huge resurgence of the multiple state in Europe and just uh, to just to, to 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 close a bit, um, to close <laughs> uh, th this idea that democracy is not a quote, a very small quote from Francière, democracy is not the modern abandonment a limitation that destroys the authority heterotopy necessary to politics. Quite the opposite, it is the founding force of such heterotopy, the first limitation to the power of the authority forms that rule the social body. And paying a tribute to Octavia Paz and to Canetti, uh, maybe it can be suggested that furthering the inclusion of little voices, being attentive to the processes that can guarantee vocality to the more suffering ones, put them in a relation, will contribute to make them more resistant to the onslaughts of the survivor and to the stingers of power wherever it resides, in Ireland or anywhere else. It can be a way of lessening the violence of the micro wars, also through taking down the stiffness implied in the categorizations, the insistence in signification, characteristic of power of whichever order. It may therefore cherish the emergence of further and more meaningful and worlds, plethoras of possible normalities, hopefully generous ways of being a feast not driven by pain. And that's it. <laughs> I Did I stick to the time? Yes, yes, we can manage everything. Thank you. So, Irene, I, I, Irene slash Irene. <laughs> I think you're Carla Irene in Ireland, but since you have Brazilian names, so I'm sorry if I got confused. Of course, that's so absolutely much. fine. Thank you so much for your for your presentation. I'm sure there will be many questions in the end. I have some myself. Uh, and now we are moving to the, the, the last presentation, <coughs> the last paper, which happens to be mine. So I'm going to introduce myself very briefly. And then I'm going to, to start my presentation. So as I told you in the beginning, I'm Michelle Varenga. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Sao Paulo, where I am developing a research about Martin McDonagh's latest three plays, uh, one of which I'm going to, to discuss with you today. And I also, I'm also a lecturer in English uh, Literature and Culture at the University of Brasilia. Uh, where I, I teach courses about English and North American culture, uh, several courses on literature, and where I, 
assist my students in writing their final um, undergraduate dissertation. So today, now let me time myself because I have to be coherent, right? Everybody has the same time. So um, I'm going to share my presentation with you. Okay, now internet, please work. Can you see me? Can someone please confirm that you're seeing my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Alessandra. Okay, let me just wait for it to open. Okay, so that I can uh, share my screen with you. Uh, I will start by saying that what I'm going to present to you today is not a theoretical analysis of this play, a very, very, very dark matter. Okay, this is a very recent play that premiered in 2018. What I'm going to, to do is I'm going to discuss it closely, uh, um, the topics that it brings, the, the matters that it discusses, the delicate themes that it brings uh, to life on stage through the representation of history. So the title of my paper is Revisiting History Through the Representation of Revolution an analysis of Marty McDonough's play, a very, very, very dark matter. And these are my two emails. If you want to contact me, please feel free to write. The picture that I have put here is the picture of the production itself. So if you go to the website of the Bridge Theatre, where this play was performed, and only this once it was performed in 2018, you're going to see this picture in the in the page of the production and it is a, a box a, a wooden box with this hole through which you can see this human eye and you're going to understand why very briefly so uh uh amongst the themes the symposium was um accepting of papers i mean the themes for papers are the literature of revolution and independence and the reception of irish literature and my paper addresses these two topics. I'm going to briefly talk to you about uh, the idea of revolution and independence in the Lieutenant of Inishmore. And I decided to do it because it's a, it's a quite famous play written by Martin McDonough that coincidentally, I'm very glad that we are together in this panel, talks about the troubles, talks about the pain as uh, um, Arin was, was discussing. And then I'm going to, to, to show you to, to discuss with you how Marty McDonough readdresses the very same idea of revolution and independence 17 years later in a very, very, very dark matter. So I will briefly cover the Lieutenant of Inishmore. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a play that premiered in 2001. It was first performed by the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford-upon-Avon, so in England. Uh, and it uh, premiered in 2001, in spite of the fact that the play had been ready for many years before. It was refused by many theatres, precisely because it talks about the troubles. And it's a comedy. It's a play that talks about the troubles through humour. Through humour and through a lot of violence, which it's a combination that is very typical of Marty McDonough, both in his plays as well as in his movies. And the protagonist, here you can see Patrick, he, is, uh, he belongs to Inla, so he's part of a paramilitary group. The play itself, I'm not to discuss it in length, it puts there on stage the extreme violence of uh, uh, involved in revolutions. So the paramilitary group, so this, all these characters here, they are part of the same paramilitary group. And Pat Patrick uh, is thinking about um, creating his own paramilitary group. He wants to separate from Inla and, and, and create a group of his own. And then the play puts there, uh, uh, what are the, what, why are they killing? Why, what are they fighting for? So from all the characters in the play, only three survive. And the rest, and I'm sorry for the spoiler, okay? I, I, I do it immediately. The rest uh, uh, is killed on stage and they stay there on stage, killed. And do they kill each other because of Ireland? Do they kill each other because they are from the North and the other characters are from the Republic? No, the assassinations, the, 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 the slaughter happens because of cats. So the play puts there, criticizes 
very uh, uh, fiercely the dangers of fanatic terrorism. And this somehow connects with what Alessandra brought in her paper, that you had paramilitary groups on both sides and you had the British army. So the violence was, was actually happening in both sides and they were killing each other in, 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 good, in great numbers. And it's, it's interesting that somehow my paper talks and, and, and complements some of the things that have already been said today. Um, and I brought here, I'm not going to read everything because of the time, but I brought here some quotations by Dr. Patrick Lonergan, uh, um, a professor at National University Ireland in Galway, in which he discusses the, the importance of this play, even though it was not, it, and he says it is still not very famous in Ireland because of the way it depicts precisely the dangers of uh, uh, this fanatic terrorism. So he says that the target of this play is not just Irish terrorism, but also the compliant and complacent culture that makes it possible. Uh, Ireland is in a place that has entered a state of profound moral crisis, largely as a result of its own people's actions. And of course, here we can complement and connect to what uh, Irene said about the, model, the, the meddling laundries and a lot of things that have been revisited in Irish history, the confrontations that have been happening. Uh, in this play, McDonald shows a similar need to redress a confusion between morality, ethics, principles, military tradition, political uh, doctrine. The Lieutenant of Inishmore reveals the facts that are obscured by Republican rhetoric. So maybe this is why it's, it's a play that is not performed as much in Ireland as it is in England and other places of the world, maybe. And then the most important thing for what I'm going to present you next, it's a play that forces the audience to consider the real consequences of those plays, of what is being performed on stage. The function of the references to victims of Irish terrorism in the lieutenant, which actually happened, is to remind the audience that the events on stage have a real political context. So there are some names in the play, there are some rebel songs that are sung in the play that actually show the audience that there is a real context behind it and that they should think about what they are seeing. A very, very, very dark matter is the very last play Martin McDonough uh, wrote, or I, 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 I prefer to say has written because I hope there are more. It premiered in 2018 in the Bridge Theatre in London and it was produced only this once. There, there, there were not uh, further productions of a very, very, very dark matter. It takes place in the eight, uh, in the late 19th century, okay, in Copenhagen. So it's outside of Ireland, and it's an attic where this gentleman here lives, and this man is Hans Christian Andersen. He's one of the protagonists of the play. I chose this picture to present it to you because in the back. You can see a, a, a wooden box, a very big one, that is, you know, it's, it's, it's pendular, it's actually going from one side to the other uh, uh, on, on the stage. And inside of it, there was a woman, not a doll, a real woman, a pygmy, an African woman uh, from the Congo. Her name is Mabut Masakele, but Hans Christian Andersen calls her Marjorie. He baptized her with a name that he wanted her to have. And although the play takes place in this attic in Europe, in Denmark, the theme of the play is the genocide of the Congo. And the revolution, the impetus of revolution that we can see in the play is the pygmy's resistance. Essentially, this lady here, and then I'm going to share my next screen, Mabut Masakele, so Marjorie, she is imprisoned by Hans Christian Andersen. I, I think you can see that she has one foot missing. This foot was, was cut by him as a punishment, sorry. So this uh, uh, um, brings back all the, 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 the violences that were performed in the Congo, that hands and, and feet were cut off. Uh, and she writes his stories. She is the mind behind his story. She, has uh, the authorship for his stories, but he gets the credit. 
So this is why he imprisons her in his attic, in this box, so that she's hidden, so that she can't escape. In the back uh, uh, of this box, there is a hole. So this is the eye that we see in the in the page of the production. We see her eye through the hole we have in this uh, wooden panel. And here, display is interesting because it puts a lot of the types of violence that are committed or that can be committed to form. Maybe it's it's even better in the process of colonization. So you have the imprisonment, you have the mutilation, you have a female woman being imprisoned and being uh, voiceless. There is the problem of authorship. She writes and he gets the credit and she's silenced, she's hidden, but she's very smart and she's very strong. And what is her aim throughout the play? To go to the Congo to save the Congo. Here, I should tell you that there is a surreal element in the play that makes the plot possible, which is time travel. Marjorie, or Mabut Masakele, she travels back in time 27 times, sorry, 27 years back in time. And she's imprisoned by Hans Christian Andersen. She's preparing herself and she's getting ready to escape and go back to Africa. She already knows what is going to happen. She already knows that her family is going to be killed. And she goes, she wants to return to Africa to save Congo, the Congo in the future. So it's a bit difficult to follow the time, uh, uh, the chronology of the play, but the time travel is an element without which the play would not have been possible. Uh, there is another detail in the play that um, Hans Christian Andersen, that is played by Jim Broadbent, goes to London for five weeks to, tra to visit Charles Dickens. And then in a moment of the play, we are in two different places. We are in the attic in, in Denmark, where Marjorie is imprisoned in the box, but we also are in London. In the same way that Hans Christian Andersen had a pygmy lady who wrote his stories, Charles Dickens also had his very own uh, pygmy lady who wrote his stories. And she happens to be Marjorie's sister, or Mabut Masakele's sister, Ojechi. And in the same way that Anderson renamed uh, Mabut Masakele as Marjorie, Dickens renamed uh, Ojechi uh, as Pamela. And she died. She was killed by him. Uh, when he gets there, when Anderson gets there and finally discovers that he's not the only prestigious writer who has his stories written by someone else, he discovers that Dickinson's, uh, and then he, they say like this, pygmy lady in a box, she's dead. But there is a, one thing that I want to say about this, that the play implies that aside uh, uh, from all the, the colonial violences that Marjorie Mabut Masakele had been suffering with Anderson, so being imprisoned, being enslaved, being voiceless, having hands and, and feet cut off. Uh, the play implies that Charles Dickens uh, uh, performed sexual violence against her. So this extra violence uh, uh, that is put on this uh, colonized uh, subject. The last thing I wanted to talk about this play, it's a very complex play, so it would be impossible to, to bring an analysis in 15 minutes. I think that for the, the symposium and for what the symposium wants to achieve, it would be much better that I presented it to you. It's a play that has not been studied very much in Brazil yet, and I think it has a lot to offer. So these two characters, Dirk and Barry, they are Belgium, and they time travel in the same way as Marjorie. During the genocide of the Congo, Marjorie being part of the resistance, she kills them both. And they travel back in time to kill Marjorie before she can return to Africa and then kill them. And then in their dialogue, they say, of course, none of this has happened yet. None of this will happen for 27 years. That's why we've come back to nip it in the bud. So we've come back to prevent her from returning from the Congo. We will kill her now, and she will not kill us in the future. She thinks she can stop it ever happening. That's why she came back. She can't stop it ever happening, can she? 10 million people. That's a lot of fucking people. 
if you think about it. So when this thing, this scene, when they have this dialogue, they start saying, it's because of the bicycles, you know, everybody wanted a bicycle and the bicycle, the bicycles need the tires and we needed the rubber for the tires. And then they develop this dialogue saying, this is why we had to kill 10 million, million people in the Congo, because the people in Europe needed bicycles. Um, this is a very strong thing about the play because it talks about the genocide. It talks about, as Professor Luke Gibbons was, talk, was discussing the crime against humanity and Marty McDonough brings that to the stage. Um, the outrageous reality in the stage is not the violence, the killings that is typical of McDonald, McDonald's aesthetic, but is the history behind it, the genocide, the killing of 10 million people. Fintan O'Toole, and then I'm quoting him, he says that McDonald belongs to the Irish Gothic tradition, and it has always been about the sublimation of very real horrors into imaginary terrors. The play itself, I'm not going to read, just I have here my, oh, just I need one more minute. The, the play, the reception of the play was not very good. So although when Treneman gave four stars to it, the, the opening paragraph of her review is, the title of this play needs at least three more varies to give you a feel for the Stygian creepy octopus ink level blackness here. Okay? There are black holes out there in the universe saying to each other, don't miss this, we can learn from it. There is a limit to how hilarious went on acts of cruelty can be. And um, uh, this determinedly dark and twisted fable is sadly lacking in emotional and intellectual ones. So the reception of the play for many reviewers was not very positive. But I want to, the, la the very last thing I want to say uh, is that Fintan Tool again, he wrote an article that was part of the productions program in which he says that in this play, uh, because Marty McDonough is unanchored, so he leaves Ireland after uh, the lieutenant of Inishmore, and he leaves Ireland, what I mean with this is that Ireland is never again the setting of his place. He goes to uh, the Pillow Man, that is in a fictitious nation, and then he goes to the United States, and then he goes to England as a setting, and now he's in Denmark talking about the Congo, so he's unanchored. And this makes him uh, deeply conscious of boundaries and relentlessly determined to cross them. Outlandish stories are all about uh, testing where the boundaries might be or whether they exist at all. Boundaries between the real and the fantastic, between comedy and terror, between the speakable and the unspeakable. McDonough follows his stories where he thinks they want to go, even if the places they want to occupy are often profoundly uncomfortable ones. And this is the most important thing about this play and how it connects to what we want to achieve in this symposium. Uh, the consequences, the perspectives of the 100 years after Irish independence. McDonough, being Irish, he's aware of borders, of the, the horrors of colonization, of these types of violence, of resistance. He showed this in uh, the Lieutenant of Inishmore when talking about the troubles. And this awareness that McDonough has allowed him to talk about the Congo. Uh, and to, it's impossible to talk about an Irish writing about the Congo and not bring uh, to light what Roger Casement did in the report. So it's interesting how Martin McDonough applies his the senses, the awareness that he has because he's Irish, and it puts him in a place that he's able to bring the, the crisis, the, the difficulties, the challenges that another nation uh, has been through precisely because of colonization. The, in the very last page, the narrator, there is a narrator in the play, but this is not the objective of my presentation. He says, after Marjorie sets herself free and she is about to return to the Congo, he says, whether she succeeded or whether she failed, only time will tell us, really. It is a truth, though, a sad and sorry truth, that to this very day, all over Belgium, statues still stand to King Leopold II, 
always with a beard, often with a sword in his hands, never with blood on them. So this is in the play, in the text, when it was performed to the British audience in 2018. In 2018. In 2020, because of the Black Lives Matter movement, this started to happen. So statues of Leopold II all over Belgium started to be vandalized. Now he has blood in his hands, can you see? All over Belgium. This one was burnt. They started to be painted in red. Things were written on them. And then they started to be removed. And then here I have some some uh, 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 pieces of news for you to see in 2020. So if we think about the relevance of Martin McDonald's uh, uh, work, and then I'm going to stop sharing, uh, in this context of discussing independence and, and, um, and revolution, thinking what he did, that he, he wrote and performed this play in 2018, he put out there, or at least to the European audience, the atrocities of the Belgian king, I think it was one step forward to what began to happen last year. And I wonder how the play will be received if he's ever another production of it after what has been happening in the world. So this is what I wanted to present you. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so now I, I will keep my microphone open because now I have to mediate the questions.